It's midnight. Out of the last 48 hours, third mate Gregory Cousins has slept six. He is now in control of one of the largest vessels on water, a super tanker filled with 53 million gallons of crude oil. Give me stop at 20. Starboard 2 0, Cap. Greg's eyes are open. He appears alert. But there's something wrong. Something neither he nor his shipmates know. Greg is as good as asleep on his feet. And he's about to make history. After running aground on Bly Reef, the Exxon Valdez spilled more than 11 million gallons of crude oil into Prince William Sound, devastating 23 species of wildlife and nearly 1,300 miles of shoreline habitat. It is the largest oil spill and one of the greatest environmental disasters in American history. A direct cause was lack of sleep. But it's not the only disaster. The Space Shuttle Challenger tragedy, the Bhopal toxic chemical leak, the space station near collision. In each case, investigators found that critical personnel suffered sleep deprivation. It's a worldwide problem, and it's getting worse. The closer we get to a global 24-hour society, the less sleep we get, the more alert we need to be, and the more important it becomes to explore, understand, and harness the science of sleep. sitting down? According to the Sleep in America poll, we know where you are. Nearly 90% of us spend the hour before bedtime watching television. So you might be lying down. But according to the same poll conducted by the National Sleep Foundation in Washington, D.C., you're probably not sleeping. 63% of us do not get enough sleep to be healthy. 69% suffer frequent sleep problems, and 22% are so sleepy during the day that it sometimes interferes with what we do. 22%? That's one person in five. How many of those people drove past you this morning on your way to work? You ask people, they'll tell you diet's important, exercise is important, but sleep is not on the map yet, in spite of the fact that it's absolutely vital for us. Experts generally agree that most of us should get roughly eight hours a night. But apart from that, we don't really know a lot about sleep. It's a human mystery riddled with questions. What is it? What does it do for us? How does it work? And if sleep is as important to health as exercise, why don't we do more of it? In the latest National Sleep Foundation poll, we know that 33% of the people would rather work than basically do anything else, sleep, sex, etc. The numbers prove it. 65% of those polled say that when they do get tired during the day, they are very likely to accept their sleepiness and keep going. That means way more than half of us will keep building and driving and working and ignore the personal and public dangers caused by lack of sleep. In our society today, getting less sleep and pushing through it and having that right stuff macho attitude actually says getting less sleep is good. It's the right thing to do. But it's not the right thing to do. Not getting enough sleep can be downright hazardous and affects everyone from construction workers to homemakers. I was um, about 35 I would say when I first started waking up in the night. Barbara Olson had that typical right stuff attitude. She's a mother of six who knows what it's like to take sleep deprivation to a dangerous extreme. I would go to bed happily at 10 o'clock and around two o'clock I would wake up and I would be wide awake. But she wasn't losing sleep because of deadlines or a night shift. Barbara had chronic insomnia, a common sleep disorder with a variety of characteristics. It can be difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, waking up too early, or 
seeming to be asleep through the night and still waking up feeling uh, quite unrefreshed. There are two kinds, basic insomnia that can last days, sometimes weeks, and chronic insomnia, a terrifying cycle that can last years. Barbara's case was very significant. She had a significant sleep problem going on for close to 10 years. It was having a major impact on her functioning as a mother. It was starting to affect her ability to drive. It was affecting her memory, concentration. I am so tired that when I'm driving, I hope that I'll hit a pole. I, I do, because then maybe they'll take me to the hospital and maybe they'll put me in a room by myself and do you know what, I'm just gonna sleep. It may sound extreme, but Barbara was so sleep deprived from chronic insomnia, a car accident actually seemed like a rational excuse to get some sleep. But unless you've been there, you don't know how tired you are. But what is a good night's sleep? Some of us may know how to get one, but science still doesn't know what it is. Unlike the evolution of other body functions like eating or walking or speaking, science has yet to discover a fundamental reason for sleep. If you're sleeping, you're not taking care of your young, you're not foraging for food, you're not engaging in a lot of activities that are important for survival. Um, so sleep has to be doing something important. And it's a little bit of an embarrassment that we don't know what. Embarrassing, but not surprising. Serious sleep research didn't even begin until the early 50s. And it wasn't until the 1980s that science found that depriving lab rats of sleep for about 17 days actually proved fatal. We keep them awake, and in about 17 days they would die. And you might ask, what do they die from? And yet another embarrassment in sleep research, we don't know. We don't know. Yet. We do know that blood poisoning and immune system breakdown played a part, but research is still being done. When we do find out why sleep deprivation is fatal, we'll have answers to questions like, is short-term sleep deprivation harmful? Is it cumulative? Can we plan for sleep deprivation? And will we one day be able to train for it? At 282 feet below sea level, it's the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere. And with temperatures as high as 128 degrees Fahrenheit and less than two inches of rainfall a year, Death Valley is also the hottest, driest place in North America. The perfect setting for the world's toughest 500-mile bicycle race. It's called the Furnace Creek 508. I'm a little nervous, but not as nervous as last year, and I just have to ride my bike. Thank you. Okay. Debbie Kaplan, a 30-something lawyer from the Los Angeles area, has been to this starting line twice before, once as part of a support team and last year as a competitor. But she never saw the finish line. I don't know whether that was probably just because I'm not used to staying up more than 24 hours or because I hadn't been eating properly the whole time. So this time we have that under control. So I know I'm going to be sleepy, but I'm, I'll be better with my food intake at least. This year, Debbie is ready to tackle the heat, the hills, and the distance of the Furnace Creek 508. But aside from a good night's sleep before the race, she knows of no way to train for the extreme sleep deprivation she's about to endure. You ride strong? I will. I'll see you in 29 Over the next 48 hours, Debbie will sleep only one. For her return to Furnace Creek, Debbie has spent the past 12 months planning her personal strategy. She knows what she wants to eat, how much to drink, how fast to go. She even thinks she's prepared for her one 60-minute session of sleep. But is she? Can Debbie finally beat Furnace Creek? So far so good. Humans are definitely programmed to sleep. Uh, there are systems that are in the brain, uh, and they appear to be there for that express purpose, to ensure that we sleep. These brain systems use naturally occurring chemicals called neurotransmitters that travel between nerve cells and trigger our body's impulses to fall asleep and wake up. I wanted to go down like in Furnace Creek, which is about 250, something like that, 260. And at that, because at that point, you're halfway through Death Valley, and then you're fresh. 
Furnace Creek the halfway point. Debbie will be defying her body. Every overworked muscle will be on fire. Every brain synapse will plead for her to stop peddling, rest, and finally sleep. She probably doesn't know the science of it, but to beat Furnace Creek, Debbie will have to override her body's natural tendency to sleep. Can she do it? I'm actually feeling a little sleepy, and I think it's because it's in the sun beating on me all day. <laughs> We'll know in 48 hours. I censor this. Dr. William Dement, the acknowledged father of sleep research, has spent half a century unraveling its mysteries. In 1953, he helped pioneer the discovery of two distinct sleep types, rapid eye movement, or REM sleep, and non-REM sleep. When we began to describe rapid eye movement sleep and realized that th that period of sleep, these repeated periods of sleep were associated with very vivid dreaming. I was very excited because I thought, wow, I've got, this is a royal road to uh, understanding mental illness and psychosis. To Dement, a young scientist interested in dreams and psychoanalysis, REM sleep was the first physical connection between dreams and medical science. He hoped it might be the key that unlocked the mysteries of the mind. That's why, in 1963, when a persistent teenager named Randy Gardner planned a science project to investigate the effects of extreme sleep deprivation, Dr. Dement was there. I and a colleague went to San Diego and monitored him 24 hours a day, and we were waiting to see if he would, you know, become psychotic, become crazy. Tempting madness, Randy Gardner stayed awake for a record 264 hours. Well. Basically, until about the ninth or tenth day, I, I, I didn't have any problems. I slurred my words and I couldn't remember things, but I didn't have any hallucinatory type things until very late in the experiment. One I remember vividly is it was a stop sign. It was just a pole with a, you know, the stop sign on top, and he thought it was a, someone looking at him and watching him. They said that I was grumpy. Of course I was grumpy. <laughs> I mean, you go 11 days without sleep, you're going to be grumpy, folks. Trust me on this one. After 11 days of monitoring the most sleep-deprived man ever, Dement's royal road to understanding mental illness had taken an unexpected turn. When he finally went to sleep, we did a full neurological exam, mental, mental exam. Uh, he was just completely normal. Randy Gardner had suffered all the typical effects of sleep deprivation, like irritability. But after 11 days awake, he slept for 14 hours and woke up nothing but rested. To be perfectly honest, the Randy Gardner experiment kind of proved that sleep loss didn't cause psychosis, if anything. Not exactly the key that unlocked the mind, but important, because it spurred Dr. Dement deeper into the mysteries of sleep. Over the next several years, he and his students, like Dr. Mark Rosekind, tore sleep apart and put it back together until REM and non-REM had been refined into two basic sleep stages, active and quiet. When you hit the sheets, quiet or non-REM sleep happens first and usually lasts from 40 to 80 minutes. And basically in non-REM, everything slows down in our body. So your head hits a pillow and your brain activity slows, your thinking slows, your breathing slows, everything slows down in your body. The second state, active or REM sleep, is just that, active. REM sleep and active sleep, your brain is as active as when you're awake, and what it's doing is in creating dreams and sending signals to your body to actually act out the dreams. But our bodies are paralyzed, They're like having the brakes on, so you're not actually expressing what's going on in the dream. It's also thought that the brain uses the active sleep state to consolidate its memory, like doing the filing. So quiet sleep would take care of fatigue, and active sleep would take care of the memory filing. But past that, whether these two sleep states have a connection to psychosis or the inner workings of the mind is still unknown. Kaplan, our endurance rider, has been on her bike for nearly eight hours. She's tired, but her body is still very much awake. I've done just half a mile under 100 miles. So one-fifth down, five, four to go. 
Over the next few hours, the question for Debbie will be when to sleep. But the ongoing question for science is how do we sleep? What biological system makes us fall asleep and wake up? The latest and most promising lead does not come from humans or rats, but something much smaller around the lab, the common fruit fly. There's a long-standing history of being able to do interesting genetic tricks, if you will, with the fly. So being impatient, uh, I decided to see whether the fly even had a state that resembled sleep. And it turns out that it does. We've been able to show that they really do sleep in ways that meet essentially the same criteria as you apply to other animals. In fact, research implies that during sleep, a fruit fly's biological sleep mechanism turns off many of the same genes as the human brain mechanism. In other words, fruit flies sleep the same way that you do. They don't snore, and they don't curl up in a little bowl in the corner and close their eyes. Um, in fact, what the main thing is that they just stop, they become immobile. And you don't know that that's sleep until you do a few other things to prod them and see if, if it meets any of the things that would define it as sleep. We gave them caffeine. And just like caffeine affects you, the, these animals stayed awake. We gave them antihistamines, and they slept more. The, so the evidence is there that the fly can tell us things about ourselves that we wouldn't be able to figure out otherwise. We know that there are natural chemicals found in the fruit fly that help us sleep and other chemicals that help us wake up. With more research, we could find out what regulates those chemicals in the fruit fly and develop a natural sedative or stimulant for humans. The, the holy grail of a lot of sleep research, I think, is to, is to understand sleep well enough to be able to uh, intervene and affect human health and public safety. If this holy grail of research pans out, it could explain why we sleep and, in turn, make a real difference to people worldwide that suffer from what are generally known as sleep disorders. I sleptwalk all my life. Then I started sleep eating is 25 or 30 years ago. Kitty Jacobs, a 41-year-old wife and mother, has almost learned to cope with her strange and rare sleep disorder. It's called sleep eating. And it's just what it sounds like. Only it's not always the groceries that get consumed. I drank whisk one night and had to go to the hospital and was really sick. So it made me face the fact that I really did have a problem. The kitchen, nighttime, sharp knives, poison, fire. When you're unconscious and hungry, there are few places in the house as dangerous. It's a joke at my house now. I mean, with the family, you just laugh about it. But it's no laughing matter. I did fresh my ankle, I don't know how. My son's Easter candy, I, I opened it up and ate it and wrapped it back up like it had never been touched. Sleep eating, or nocturnal eating syndrome, is classified as a partial awakening disorder, which roughly means the victim is half awake and half asleep, like sleepwalking. And like sleepwalking, we know that it can be caused by stress and that it's sometimes hard to tell when it's happening. When she does it, she's actually looks awake and you can't really tell a difference until maybe the next day you ask her if she remembers doing it and she doesn't have any recollection. The individuals usually uh, do not have much if any awareness of what they're doing and are only aware of it when they awaken in the morning and, and see fingerprints of what they've done the preceding night. For Kitty Jacobs, those fingerprints could mean an upset stomach or fractured ankle. But for some, sleepwalking episodes can turn deadly. In 1987, Kenneth Parks left his bed, got into his car, and drove 14 miles along an Ontario highway to the home of his in-laws. He entered the house with a key they had given him and made his way to their bedroom. There, he choked his father-in-law into unconsciousness and stabbed his mother-in-law to death. Kenneth 
Parks then got back into his car and drove to a police station. When he arrived, the policeman on duty noticed something strange. Kenneth was sound asleep, the apparent victim of a sleepwalking episode. We know that some families have a history of sleepwalking and that it occurs during quiet or non-REM sleep. We know that stress can trigger an episode, and we know a variety of treatments, including hypnosis. What we don't have an answer for yet is what makes one individual have a completely benign activity in the same physical state while they are sleepwalking, and what makes another individual carry out uh, quite a, a very horrific activity. The 23-year-old Parks was acquitted, one of the very few people in history to successfully use sleepwalking as a defense against a seriously violent act. I think it's gonna be, that's the end of the hard part, so I won't be so hot now. At mile 150, our endurance rider, Debbie Kaplan, is nine hours in and totally focused. She is still very much in control. Okay, well, we're gonna do a downhill again when I get yep. so cold. Okay. But as she rides into her first night, the effects of her sleep deprivation will intensify. Her motor skills will deteriorate and control will be lost. A physical phenomenon that can be terrifying on the road and sometimes in the bedroom. I can say it's interesting now after the fact. I, I can also quite honestly say singularly it was the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. Dr. Mark Mahald is a neurologist in Minneapolis. His sleep clinic studies and treats people with sleep disorders. He never expected to become a victim. I had been sleep deprived. I was taking a nap and I halfway woke up from the nap to find that I was totally paralyzed and I tried to scream and shout to call attention to my plight because I was convinced that I was dying. But Mark couldn't scream. He was experiencing a disorder known as sleep paralysis, a complete inability to move one's body or open one's eyes for several minutes, either just before sleep or just before waking. Then a little bit more wakefulness came into it and I woke up just enough to perceive what was really happening to me and I was almost amused but then I would slip back deeper and lose the, the reality testing and then again become absolutely convinced that I was dying. We don't know why it happens, but we do know how. During REM or dream sleep, our bodies become paralyzed as a safeguard mechanism so that we won't act out our dreams. And that one piece of REM sleep may come in to play before the rest of the dream sleep and the individual is awake but absolutely paralyzed. Likewise, one can awaken from a REM sleep period and have all the other elements of REM sleep leave except the paralysis. The result is total body paralysis. The only treatment is education. A victim, even a neurologist, must be aware of what's happening to ride out an episode. Sleep paralysis holds a victim immobile. They can't move. But what happens when the opposite is true? When you should be sleeping, but can't stop moving? People tell stories of, of getting on their hands and knees and rocking and just trying to, to get through uh, the moment. And there have been many times, and I still uh, have some of these times when the medicines stop working, where I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get through the next 60 seconds. It can sometimes feel like a jolt of electric current or like worms slithering and squirming. It's called restless leg syndrome, or RLS. And Peter Brooks, a retired investment banker, has had a severely active case for many years. When I did the sleep study, they wired me up, and if you have more than 50 movements a uh, night, it's a pretty good indication that uh, one has restless leg syndrome. And the first night I had 304, and they thought the machine had broken, and the next night I had 345. RLS itself is not fatal but can be greatly debilitating, especially after lack of sleep. It is a progressive disease, 
which means it gets worse. But there is help through medication. It is a serious disease, and, and um, it, it is one of the tragedies is that it is so many people are suffering from it, and yet it is so unknown. Sleep disorders of any stripe can be disruptive, even frightening. But even more frightening is our general attitude toward a good night's sleep. We want. When the supertanker Exxon Valdez ran aground in Prince William Sound, the National Transportation and Safety Board determined that the number one probable cause of the grounding was the failure of the third mate to properly maneuver the vessel because of fatigue and excessive workload. The number two cause was the failure of the vessel captain to provide proper navigation watch because of impairment from alcohol. The number two cause, alcohol, was never proven, but still grabbed the headlines and remains in public memory. Yet the number one cause, fatigue, was largely ignored. A classic example of our global attitude towards sleep deprivation. I have the image of this high dam with this huge reservoir of knowledge. You know? But the floodgates are up, no water is trickling to the people who need it. Our global community is sleep deprived. Disasters like the Valdez prove it. And according to the U.S. Institute of Medicine and the Logicon study on fatigue and human performance, so do medical statistics. 71,000 injuries on American highways caused by drivers falling asleep. 15,000 medical errors, many caused by drowsy caregivers misdiagnosing or mistreating patients. 21% of aviation incidents. 31% of heavy truck accidents. 33% of railroad accidents, all citing operator fatigue. People should appreciate the fact that sleep is a biological imperative. It is important, and we must appreciate the fact that sleep deprivation extracts a major toll personally and societally in the home, in the workplace, in the classroom, and behind the wheel. Last year, Debbie Kaplan couldn't finish the Furnace Creek 508 mile bicycle race. She was too tired. Will she see the finish line this time? At roughly 220 miles in, she and her support team are almost halfway home. They're beginning to feel the effects of genuine sleep deprivation, and this descent into Towns Pass is terrifying. I'm pretty tired. I'm actually having a little bit of a second wind. I was falling asleep on that downhill. It was a little bit scary. The road is straight and steep, but every now and then, Debbie rides out of her pace vehicle's headlamps and into total darkness. It's like hitting a big black wall. She has to remind herself to breathe. I've been awake for 22 hours, a little bit under 22 hours, so it's a long time for me. As physically fit as she is, Debbie's mind is beginning to lose control of her body's movements. Even her eyes are sending sleep signals to her brain. Here's how it works. Light taken in from the retina is transferred through the nerves to a minute structure in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus, which determines the amount of light entering the body. Debbie's body clock knows it's night and that it's time to sleep. It will signal the rest of her body accordingly. In short, Debbie Kaplan's body is about to shut down. Now I'm really sleepy. I'm looking forward to Furnace Creek because I need a nap. I hope I can sleep, actually. After all that, I feel kind of wired. Debbie's coach wants her to sleep for one hour because according to scientifically proven techniques, that's roughly how long one complete sleep cycle lasts. I'd like to give her a full hour because uh, it'll help. It'll make a big difference. It's a whole new world. Science has also proven that waking after a period of REM sleep will leave Debbie somewhat refreshed, like having a nap. Ugh, I don't even want to know what my hair looks like, so don't look. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm taking off my shoes. That's okay. This is masochistic. After more than 20 hours, Debbie is still in the race. Of the 97 riders who entered, six have dropped out before this halfway point. But there are still 258 miles to go. Debbie has one day and part of a night, just over 20 hours, to beat Furnace Creek. Can she do it? Okay, all right. Well, I'm gonna be right here in okay. the front seat, so if you get cold. Okay. Okay? Good night, guys. Good night, guys. For an athlete, fatigue can be an incentive, even a motivator. But what happens when exterior pressure is added to the equation? What happens when you're forced to stay awake? Sleep deprivation has been used as a form of torture for centuries. The basic logic is to defeat the victim from within, confuse them with lack of sleep. To combat it, experienced torture victims purposely injure themselves, rubbing a body part raw. The pain gives their minds something real to hold on to, to drive confusion away. It doesn't work for long. Eventually, fatigue does win out. A victim will surrender and confess. But are those confessions reliable? A sleep deprivation and suggestibility study conducted by Dr. Mark Blagrove at the University of Wales indicates that they are not. What we did was uh, we gave people a standard test of suggestibility, which means that they have to remember so about a, a story about an incident uh, that happened. Yes. And, uh, the story was there? told to 47 was, uh, people who had missed one or two nights sleep. Yes. Recall what Jamil was that night. Uh, then yes, specific yes, questions yes, were asked. There was an earthquake in Turkey last week. Have you heard anything about that in the newspapers? The majority of the questions are leading questions, and you can't answer them from the basis of the story. So what you're supposed to say is, I don't know. Yes, there was uh, something like 25 dead. I can't remember all that wasn't in the story, that type of thing. It was, uh, I believe it was an 8.5. Dr. Blagrove's study found that sleep-deprived subjects were highly suggestible, their minds not working properly. Their ability to make a simple decision was so impaired, they embraced fantasy as reality. Yes. What we found was that not only were they making suggestible answers, but that they were as confident in those answers. Do you recall what kind of movie it was? Yes, uh, it was... Uh, as they were when they were awake and alert. So in other words, they're giving us suggestible answers, but they actually believe in them as well. So it was uh, starring uh, Ben Stiller. So if lack of sleep affects our ability to make a decision to that degree, effectively making fantasy reality, what does it mean to people who experience sleep deprivation on a regular basis? Are they, and the people who depend on them, at serious risk? August 6, 1997, Korean Airlines Flight 81 slammed into high terrain three miles southwest of Agana, Guam, killing all but 26 of the 254 passengers and crew on board. According to a report issued by the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board, the sleep-deprived captain failed to execute a very simple landing. He missed the runway. The board determined that his ability to make a decision had been severely affected, that he was fatigued. A symptom of sleep deprivation that can be made worse by a condition known as jet lag, which, thanks to new research, may someday be a problem of the past. Jet lag is basically when you take your internal body clock and you put it in another time zone, and so there's a disconnect or a desynchrony between your internal clock and the outside environment. Everyone's internal body clock works on a circadian rhythm. Circadian means around a day, which is roughly 24 hours. And when a new time zone mixes up that circadian rhythm, it takes a couple of days or longer for our 24-hour body clock to catch up. But that may change once new genetic research is explored. The new research has found that people who have a genetically inherited sleep disorder, known as familial advanced sleep phase syndrome, have a body clock that runs three to four hours faster than normal. In other words, their circadian rhythm is being controlled in an uncommon pattern. 
What's exciting is that it's genetic. That's important, because if we can identify the gene that controls this faster body clock, it could lead us to the protein it produces, which could then be used to formulate new drugs to treat jet lag and other conditions. It would be wonderful if we could actually put ourselves in a situation where we could more rapidly align the body clock with other important drives, I think especially sleep. There's just one hitch. Researchers say that finding this body clock gene is like finding a single broken zipper amongst 80,000 pieces of luggage. Oh, I'm sick. I probably maybe only slept for 45 minutes, but yeah, I feel like it was, it was yeah. fine. It was fine, yeah. I feel pretty awake. I just am very. It's 3 a.m. Debbie Kaplan is awake and ready to hit the road. I'm cold. She has only 258 miles left to go. Can she do it? Will Debbie survive sleep deprivation uh, and beat Furnace Creek? Okay, guys. See you down the road. Tamara Snelling is a massage therapist in Portland. Two weeks before her 25th birthday, she lost her eyesight to diabetes. The major time cue in the environment is the light-dark cycle. And if you remove the light through the eyes, you have removed really the only known environmental time cue. Along with the loss of her eyesight, Tamara had also lost the ability to distinguish day from night. She had effectively been sentenced to life with jet lag. To try and compensate, Tamara set and maintained a strict daily exercise routine, and it seemed to work. For most of her adult life, her body clock stayed more or less on course. Then, things changed. I'd gone to get a, a guide dog, be trained with a guide dog, and um, the experience was pretty emotional and traumatic. It, it wasn't a good experience. Was it the pressure of training with a strange animal, the stress of learning a new skill? Whatever the reason, Tamara left the guide dog training program early and empty-handed, and immediately fell victim to depression. Her strict exercise routine faltered, and just days later, her sleep patterns followed suit. I might wake up at midnight and be awake then from midnight one o'clock till four or five a.m. and then six a.m. I'd want to go back to sleep. As with jet lag, Tamara's body clock was confused. The solution, Dr. Louis surmised, could be in the naturally occurring chemicals that we know help our bodies regulate sleep, like the hormone melatonin. Melatonin is produced by the pineal gland, which is lodged in the center of the brain and is connected to the body clock, which is connected to the eyes. For people like Tamara, whose body clock has no perception of light, the theory is that a well-timed dose of melatonin might trick the body clock into thinking it's nighttime, which might trigger other sleep-inducing elements. It was only within 10 days that it had got my clock back to near normal time. Louis's early studies seem to suggest that melatonin is an effective sleep regulating tool and with more testing could prove invaluable to body clocks and people everywhere. After 27 hours on the road with one hour sleep, Debbie Kaplan, endurance cyclist, is beginning to stress out. My hands are a little bit tired too. They really got mashed on that bumpy part of the road. It's your garden variety stress, but Debbie is using it as motivation. I just want to get there. Which begs the question, if stress can help us keep going, might it also help us get going? Could stress be our built-in alarm clock? Professor Jan Born's team of scientists at the University of Lübeck in Germany thinks so. 
for three nights, they measured the levels of two stress hormones in the blood of volunteers. We found that when people expected to be awakened at a certain time, at six o'clock in this case, during the hour before the expected awakening, there was a strong increase in the secretion of uh, stress hormones. On the first two evenings, the volunteers were told they would be awakened at 9 a.m. And on the first morning, researchers woke the volunteers at 9 a.m. But on the second morning, the volunteers were awakened at 6 a.m., three hours earlier than they were told. Then, on the third night, the volunteers were told they would be awakened at 6 a.m., and were. What the scientists found was that the stress hormones appeared to work like an alarm clock. They increased just before the planned awakening and stayed flat just before the surprise awakening, almost as if the volunteers had set an internal alarm clock simply through the power of suggestion. There must be a kind of conscious process going on during sleep or maintained during sleep which has an influence on this part of hormonal regulation. Born's experiment is the first real evidence of an internal mechanism that adapts to environmental challenges, like waking up. The theory of an internal alarm clock requires further research. We need to know more, not just about stress hormones and body clock genes, but about sleep itself and the role it plays in our daily lives. The good news is that the work is being done we are slowly gaining the knowledge that will eventually lead us all to a good night's sleep. I, uh, I think you need water, I'm not sure. Whatever you got. Debbie Kaplan has slept only one of the last 30 hours. She is physically and mentally exhausted. Her legs are on fire. Her bike saddle has chafed sores the size of half dollars into her thighs. The last thing she wants to do here at mile 301 is give up. Oi, I don't want it. I'm too tired, I can't go. I just, I'm too tired. And I'm, I'm weak. What do you think, Dad? And my, my butt's killing me. I need to stop. Some people have developed very good coping skills so that they can be getting more and more sleep deprived and somehow managing but there's a limit and a threshold and then suddenly you're over the threshold and then just everything falls apart. Might just walk. Okay. Just walk a little bit. I don't, I, I don't think I can think, go anymore. I know, we've been trying. We can talk like one step at a time, but I know it's... Just walk up the hill, okay? It's all right. Okay, I'll try. It's okay. Yeah, just walk a bit. Severe fatigue has been blamed for the early exit of many cyclists. Of the 97 who entered, only 45 remain. If Debbie gives up now, she could be the next casualty. I can't go another night. There's no way that I can go a whole other night without sleeping. Well, I know, it's okay. So far, we have no scientific proof that losing sleep will cause any lasting physical, psychological, or biochemical damage. But some scientists believe that getting enough sleep will promote longer life. Longer life, your health, your wellness, your performance, your productivity, your relationships, all those things will benefit and improve with more sleep. That I can guarantee. But how little sleep can you get away with? Research shows that most adults need at least six and a half hours of sleep per 24 hour period. Any less, and fatigue will take its toll. I just, I'm so tired, I just can't, there's just no point, I just don't care anymore. You need to understand that there are signs and symptoms that affect your memory, your attention, your mood, etc. And what are those that you should be looking for that tell you, whoops, I need to get some sleep. Whether that's a full night's sleep or a strategy like taking a nap if you need to. You're gonna try to convince me to keep going. No, it's not. <laughs> I just want you to walk through. You need to walk anyway before you, before you stop. Okay. Okay? You've been on a bike this morning. I feel, I feel a little bit nauseous. I just want to go to bed. 
Debbie Kaplan exited the Furnace Creek 508 100 miles earlier than last year. Today, you've seen Debbie Kaplan fight sleep deprivation and lose a personal battle to Death Valley. Tomorrow, when you wake up and head to work among the millions of sleep-deprived people in our world, your own personal battle will begin again. Hopefully, you'll be well-rested. I went 30 hours with one hour sleep and it just wasn't enough. So, um, it's just about limitations.